morning and welcome to the second meeting of the Edinburgh Bakers Widows Fund Committee. The first item on our agenda is to decide whether to take item three, a discussion about the evidence heard today in private, and whether to consider issues for its preliminary stage report in private at its next and future meeting. Do we agree to take item three in private and to consider issues for and a preliminary stage report in private at the next and future meetings? Okay. Agreed. Okay. Uh, today we are taking evidence from the promoters of the bill, the trustees of the widow scheme of the incorporation of bakers of the city of Edinburgh, and I would like to welcome Lady Elizabeth Drummond Young, trustee of the widow scheme of the incorporation of bakers of the city of Edinburgh, member of the incorporation of, the, of bakers of the city of Edinburgh, and trustee of the incorporation of bakers of Edinburgh Charitable Trust. I also like to welcome Flora Aspen, solicitor and agent for the Trust Incorporation and Charity. And I'd like to invite the panel to make an opening statement. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, on behalf of the promoters of the Edinburgh Bakers Widows Fund Bill, I'd like to thank the committee for taking the time and trouble to consider the bill. Um, and uh, Flora and I will introduce ourselves briefly, adding perhaps just a little bit to what you've, you've said. So um, I'm currently the box master of the incorporation of the Bakers of City of Edinburgh, which is essentially the treasurer of the incorporation. Uh, and I'm also, as you mentioned, uh, a trustee of the Widows Fund and the newly formed Edinburgh Bakers Trust. And my early professional career was in investment management and pension fund management. Uh, more recently, I've been involved in tutoring philosophy at the University of Edinburgh here. Um, I joined the incorporation in 2011 at the instigation of a friend uh, who is involved in reinvigorating the trades in Edinburgh. Um, they, they have been uh, obviously around for a very long time, um, but uh, there is a group of people who would like to make the Edinburgh trades, rather like the Glasgow trades, a lot more active in the city. And so at, it was his instigation that I joined the bakers, and I am a keen amateur baker, so I was very delighted to join the incorporation. Um, and perhaps it's worth just saying a little bit about the, the history of the trades in Edinburgh. They were very active, as I'm sure you will know, in the medieval times and the early modern times. And uh, in more modern times, they've fallen into really, well, I suppose, just a gentle not doing very much. Um, and so the idea is that the trades should become more part of Edinburgh city life again, but in a, in a new and invigorated form. And that's really the backdrop to uh, this bill. Uh, it's all part of that, uh, the, the, the background to why this bill is coming forward now. So can I pass over to Flora? Um, yes, good morning. Um, I'm a solicitor at Shepparton Wedderburn, um, and uh, we've been uh, involved in the incorporation for uh, and the Widows Fund for, for some years. Um, I've been dealing with them for the last couple of years um, and have been involved in the setting up of the uh, new charitable trust as well. Um, and uh, separate from that, I'm also clerk to the incorporation of bakers, um, which is sort of a admin secretarial role involved in... Uh, setting up meetings and minutes and all that sort of things. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to be uh, begin by asking, the uh, last contribution to the fund was made in 1981, and uh, it was, I think, a further 32 years before it was closed to new members. Are you able to give a potted history of what happened in that period? Um, well, uh, over the last, well, since that time, until very, very recently, the incorporation of Bakers was just sitting there as a... As a um, really is an un unincorporated association with very, very few members, so few members that um, really meetings were, must have been quite sporadic and they would tend to be elderly gentlemen who were members of the incorporation. Um, so nothing, nothing was happened. The fund wasn't attractive to uh, any new members. Uh, you had to be a male under 45. Um, you couldn't be a woman. You had to be a male under 45 in order to join the Widows Fund. So... Um, Nobody was under 45. I mean, that was, you know, people were much older than that who were members of the incorporation. Uh, and it, obviously anybody joining the incorporation would n not be li likely to want to join that fund. So um, the incorporation itself was quite dormant, uh, never mind the, the Widows Fund, because the trades in Edinburgh were not being activated. This is part of the, the backdrop I was trying to give you earlier, that it's only fairly recently, perhaps the last 10 years, that the trades in Edinburgh have been undergoing a renewal. 
And so people have been joining, not just the bakers, but the bonnet makers, uh, goldsmiths, candle makers, and so on. And so there's been a revival of interest. And the sort of people that join the trades are often, I suppose like myself, semi-retired people who've got time to spend on charitable trustee duties. Um, and, and so that's really the, the, the backdrop to, to why. Were there any efforts in that um, intervening period uh, to promote the scheme or attract new members at all? Um, well, it's a, it was a scheme that was only open to members of the incorporation. And since there were not very many members of the incorporation and the incorporation itself was not putting itself forward, then obviously there was no promotion of the Widows Fund as such. The possible to have been reliant upon the incorporation. And in terms of what has been the, uh, the timeline for taking the decision to move to a private bill and when was the sort of idea first mooted of winding it up and moving to a charitable trust? Um, it's been some years now. It's, I think uh, since I joined the incorporation, it was very short. Th this was raised as the most major issue that we had to deal with, that we had this widow's fund where the number of trustees was getting smaller and smaller, people were dying. Um, nobody was around to look after the fund, so we just had enough members of the incorporation to become trustees of the widow's fund. Um, we saw that it would not be attractive or viable because of all its very baroque uh, entry requirements. If you look at the Act of 1813, as I say, you had to be a male, you had to be under 45. Um, the conditions of, of joining and indeed the benefits that would accrue to anybody potentially are so vague and so um, so difficult to understand that it would not be an attractive vehicle for anyone to put their monies into. So we were left with a position where there was a fund of some value, um, you know, some considerable value, but that we felt would not be viable to promote to people as an investment vehicle or, or a benevolent vehicle or whatever you might want to call it in its in its current form uh, and uh, you know that being the case it, it could fall into just fall into the crown's hands eventually as, as being not being able to be used it was, it was there not being used and that was a major problem that was some years ago and we did uh, undertake various investigations as to how we could change the <coughs> conditions for the fund um, and we finally resolved on the idea that the uh, coming to a private bill was our best way forward. And, and how long was that uh, period of uh, investigation? Oh, a number of years. I think, so as I joined, I think in 2011, it's been going on since then, probably five years. Yes, I see that sounds about right. <coughs> That's something we pick back up on later. Alison. Good morning. I would just like to ask, what steps have the trustees taken to ensure that the capital payments offered to the wives of the contributing members are actually fair, both in terms of adequately compensating the wives and in relation to protecting the trust funds? Yes. Morning. Um, the trustees uh, consulted an actuary um, and, and, and asked for, uh, gave them the background and asked for an actuary report. Um, as to providing for the wives in a fair and equitable manner. Um, and the actuary came back with a report um, which the, the trustees uh, then agreed and then, in conjunction with that, consulted the wives, provided them with the actuary report and all the information, and it was then agreed, um, and it has been agreed now for, for some time, that um, that they would make a certain payment to them when the, when the, the fund was dissolved. Um, and in conjunction with that, because it's been agreed that the, the funds that would be paid out to these potential beneficiaries has actually been ring-fenced from the, um, the trust funds in itself. Um, so, you know, the trustee is absolutely certain what they're going to pay the wives when this happens. Just when this was actually agreed and when you had your actu actuarial valuation, uh, was that some time ago or is it quite recently? Because obviously things have moved on and changed. Has the, it been updated? The, 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 the position hasn't changed. Um, there are still just the two wives, as it were. Um, and uh, the, this was towards the end of 2015, so approximately 18 months ago. Um, and the, the figure was agreed then 
And, yeah, uh, I don't think that uh, given the length of actuarial yeah. calculations, yeah. it's not going to change much. And no, I just didn't know when the when yeah. that no, 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 that's made, a, so. it's a fairly in the in the history yeah. of the of yeah. this bill, it's a fairly recent yeah. Yeah. development. That's, that's good yeah. to hear. Well, uh, you know, could you maybe give me any practical examples of how being governed by the 1813 Act has constrained what you've been trying to do in relation to the Widows Fund? Uh, well, I think I've already told you the conditions for entry. So you have to be a male, you can't be a woman, you have to be under 45, you have to be a member of the incorporation, you have to pay uh, very specific sums of money, 20 shillings a uh, quarter. You are not guaranteed any form of... The, the, the benefits are not guaranteed. It's merely a kind of you pay in and then if something happens post 13 years down the road, you have to pay in, I think, for seven years and then uh, you might get something if you if you apply to the fund. Mm -hmm. So the be the benefits are very open-ended. Yes, is that, they is that are. fair? And, and, and the, it's not a personal benefit that the, the contributor would receive. No. It's it's if if they predecease their their wife, um, and therefore they they have to be married and married for a certain amount of years and to a wife who is of a certain age below them, or rather not. That's right. Too, too young in comparison to their own. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very restrictive, the criteria. Um, and uh, it's, it's not like a, a standard pension fund where, you, where you, this is something that you would see when you retire. It's a, it's a benefit that would go to, to your widow if, if she is widowed um, and if she fits the right criteria when she is widowed. And quite restrictive. Uh, yes. <laughs> I do have it in front of me, and it's really quite, you know, quite complicated. As, as Flora says, it's all to do with uh, the age of the children. If she marries again, how much younger she is than her husband. Um, it's it's incredibly uh, of its time, if I can put it that way. Well, what arrangements are in place to ensure that the assets transferred to the new charity will be appropriately managed for the public benefit? Is that? Um, well, we have constructed a, a charitable trust um, under Oscar, and so we have uh, passed all those conditions for forming a charity. We have charitable purposes set out for the trust, so it's registered with Oscar. Um, the purposes of the trust are the advancement of education and the advancements of the arts, heritage, cultural science. So we've had our purposes agreed. Um, and uh, we have had a review of uh, investment managers to see who we would give the, the, the bulk of the fund to if it became available to us. And we would uh, um, give this to uh, an investment manager um, who is a charity, a specialist charity fund manager. And we would, um, the trustees are minded to uh, give grants only a according to the income from the fund. So we wouldn't be digging into the capital of the fund. We would have a small income from this fund, which we would use to give grants applying the purposes of the trust. Um, and uh, the fund would then be managed as a conservatively as a, as a charitable trust by a specialist charity fund manager. We hope the fund would grow over time. And that's what one, one of the other points we should make about the 1813 Act is it's very constrained as to how the fund is invested. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we are able to transfer the assets to a charitable trust, we can then invest it uh, more flexibly. Um, so we, we've done all the normal things you would expect a charitable trust to do and, and being handed a pot of money that it would go to a responsible charity fund manager. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Um, the, charitable, the, the, the Widows Fund, as we know, provides um, financial support for widows of contributing um, members. And the change that you're proposing to make is, is, is quite a, a fundamental change to the core purpose of, of the fund. Um, and, and we have heard that, that normally when changes to funds similar to this are made, they, they are changed to be something similar. Um, was any consideration given to changing the fund to almost provide the same core purpose, but in a different way? Um, yes, uh, but, uh, but the answer to that, I think, is that the way in which people now expect to receive annuities or pensions or uh, any kind of benefits to them in hardship has changed so radically since 1813 that it, we would essentially be trying to set up a... Um, uh, something in competition with, let's say, Standard Life or an annuity provider. Uh, and that would seem to be completely pointless to offer people the opportunity to invest in a very small fund uh, when they have you know, a marketplace of pensions, annuity providers and specialist investment managers. That's not really the, um, 
that, that wouldn't be, a, a, to our, our mind, a competent use of the funds. In other words, what I'm saying is that the way in which people receive benefits if they're or annuities or pensions nowadays has changed so radically, even since the last payment was made out in 1980s, because 1988, I think, was the start of a personal pension drive. And so the, 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 the onus on employers, for example, to make sure that people have a pension available to them, um, and the onus on each individual in, 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 in Britain nowadays to, to think about investing for their future is so much greater than it was in 1813. Uh, and the other point to make, I think, is that in 1813, uh, when this Act was passed, that was before the Trading Act of 1846, when the trades were rather clamped down on. In other words, in 1813, things were going presumably reasonably well for the trades. 1846, trade act, Trading Act come along, and they can no longer be the sort of closed shop that they were. They had to change their business. So um, the relationship, both of the trades and of how people choose to get annuities and pensions, I think, has changed dramatically in the, in, in the intervening period. And for us to try to set up a fund which mimics, let's say, uh, an annuity provider now would just be, I think, uh, n not a good thing to do. And did, did the trustees take that decision themselves, or did they get advice from, from someone else? Um, we did take that decision ourselves. Um, we felt that we were able to take that confidently, because we have, uh, on the trustees, there's people like myself who have experience in pension fund management. There are other lawyers uh, and other people involved who've been involved in the probation service. We have a, 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 the trustees are a sort of set of people who have professional experience, and we felt able and competent to take that decision. The other thing I, I should say to you is that um, the money is in the Widows Fund and not just contributions from members of the incorporation, but the incorporation itself put some money into that fund in the early stages. How and how much, we don't know, because it's lost in the annals of you know, 19th century accounting. So, so the incorporation was putting money in there. So that for us to promote uh, uh, the trust with purposes that are very akin to the purposes of the incorporation these days seems to us to be relevant and, and you know a good thing to do. In other words, we're not moving, we're not trust is very much in line with the purposes of the incorporation of bakers. Uh, and that's has some, I think, validity to it. Yeah, and, and those purposes are charitable purposes and they do tie in with um, Oscar's charity requirements. Um, so it sort of seemed fitting that we were not only reflecting what the original incorporation's purposes were, but also moving forward towards a public benefit and tying in with, with modern-day charitable purposes. And were any other options considered in how you would be able to make this change other than a private bill? And wh how did you come to the decision that a private bill was the best way to take this forward? I, th I think one of the reasons it took us, it's taken us so long is that we have spent time considering whether, whether the private bill was the right way to go. And I don't know whether you want to say as a lawyer more about the other options. For yes, I mean, that, it, that some time was spent um, considering how this could be done. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that the, the trustees, because they, they felt that it was no longer appropriate to be governed by the 1813 Act, um, and, and because they were looking to set up a charitable trust, wished to be governed by Oscar rather than sort of by a statutory regulation, that it was appropriate to look to, to repealing the 1813 Act. Um, and in order to sort of vary the powers that they were given under the 1813 Act um, and to sort of meet their objectives, that the private bill was the way forward. And we did consider um, other options for sort of varying the purposes of, of a trust, um, looking at uh, an application to the Court of Session through a CPRE scheme um, and also an application under Section 9 of the um, Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Act, that's uh, 1990, um, which sort of, you know, was looking at the possibility of varying the trust purposes. But the problem with both of those options was that as, as you know, the, what the trustees wanted to do was, was um, quite at odds with the widow's fund purposes. Um, so we're sort of moving away from the, the purposes set out in the 1813 Act. Um, so that really wasn't the best option, because what they wanted to do was vary the powers of the trustees under the 1813 Act. So if you have taken it through court, you wouldn't have been allowed to make the changes? I think so. Um, 
Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, but the point about that is that if you make the changes going through the CPRA system, going to the court session, you, you, you can only stick very much to the purposes of, yes. of that. And you might have been able to make some changes, but you end up with a sort of rather watered down fund that is, as I say, you think about all these big annuity providers, pension providers, you'd have a little tiny fund which was just tweaked enough to be perhaps tenable in today's society, just about, for a very small group of people, a very small group of people, the members of the incorporation. Whereas as the trust stands, the, the new trust stands, we're able to offer benefits to the wider community. You know, for example, if we offer a grant so that there's baking in a primary school, or baking in a prison, a course of baking, something like that, we're able to offer wider benefits um, through that trust than we would be in a, in a twiddled about mm. scheme which would have arisen from from any adjustments that the court might let us make to this act, which, as I say, is incredibly uh, of its time. Mm -hmm. Your only option was the private bill to make yeah. the fundamental to, to, changes to make that you very, wanted. To, to make genuinely good use of the assets yeah. in line with you know, the spirit of the incorporation of beggars of the City of Edinburgh, we really felt that that was the best way to go, so that we could actually get practical, modern usage out of this money that had been invested both by members of the incorporation of beggars and by the incorporation itself who were interested in promoting baking in the city of Edinburgh, this was one way to, to use this money. And, and, and creating a charitable vehicle was, of course, the way to encase it in a you know, fully responsible mechanism that, that fits uh, today's purposes. Will you promote the, 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 the charitable um, fund and, and promoting education and training? How are you going to promote that to the wider community? And are you going to promote it um, within um, the existing baking community? Yeah. Yes. We, yes. There was quite a lot of dialogue with um, Oscar uh, uh, on, on this when we were setting up the charitable trust. And so we did you know, really have to consider, and the, and the trustees have considered, how they would promote it. Through, um, through the baking community um, and also through the usual forms of social media, et cetera, um, but essentially a sort of establishing a network yes. um, and uh, which they could then use to to promote what they want to do. Uh, two of our trustees are active. One of us is, is, is a CEO of a, of a community bread share, uh, Deborah Riddle, who would have been here but unfortunately couldn't join us this week. So she's an active member of the baking community and Wendy Barry, who's the sort of slow food guru for Scotland. So we do have people who are actively involved in the baking industry as trustees and members of the incorporation. Uh, and the plan would be that if we were able to... Um, uh, move on uh, from, from this bill, get this bill through and create the trust, then we would be in a position to get more members of the incorporation who uh, would be either bakers or people who might be suitable trustees for the trust at, at a future date. Uh, and that way we would be in, in a position to have um, uh, applications for grants coming into us. So we're confident that we would uh, be in a position to review a number of grants on, on an annual basis and apply the funds appropriately according to the purposes of the charity. And schools will be able to apply for grants as well? I think uh, yes, anyone could apply for grants to, as long as it fits the purposes of the trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how will you assess the, the success of this going forward? Will, will it be the trustees that will do that? Will they review on yes. an annual basis? It would be part of our, our job as a charity board trustees to, to review the success of, of how we're meeting the purposes of the trust. We would have to do that in a business plan and, and, and you know, review the business plan regularly and, and say how we're meeting our objectives. So, Oscar guidelines as well. Yeah, exactly. Be very exactly. important. Yeah, as that's you right. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's all part of it. That's why we're going under the Oscar banner, because we're forced to do all these um, you know, appropriate things to make sure okay. that we're using the money properly. Um, we've, we've spoken about the, the two pot potential beneficiaries that, that have been uh, identified. How confident are you that there are no other potential beneficiaries? Very yeah, confident. Very, yes. I mean, very, very confident. That, that, very, very that, confident. That, yes, yes. <laughs> that is yes. a fact. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, very confident. And what brought you to that position that you're very confident? How, how have you um, come to... qualifying members are um, and there are only two qualifying members who have made contributions who have wives who therefore are potential beneficiaries um, and it's, it's sort of as simple as that really but the, the members the, two of the members of the incorporation are 
well, I hate to say it quite elderly, they're not here, so I probably can say it quite elderly. Um, but they've been members for a very long time, and they know the history of the incorporation. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, there are minutes of the incorporations are, are, are held and recorded mm. over, over quite a few years. Yeah. So we are extremely confident that there are no other potential beneficiaries. Um, uh, and of course, we have put out, as part of this bill, public notices and... Um, to, to the so, uh, the members of the trust have been quite active and in, in been involved. When you say that they, they know what's going on, the members of the incorporation and the members that have been paying in, are, are they quite active within this fund? There, there, yes, there is some overlap between the, the obviously the members mm -hmm. and the yes. trustees of the yeah. of the, the widows' yes. fund and the trustees of the of the new charitable trust. So, yes, I would say that yes. they have been. Um, actively involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, one final question relating to uh, drafting regarding the payments to the two identified potential future beneficiaries. Um, it states under section one that the trustees may but not must um, make them an offer. Uh, may confers a power, must confers an obligation. I just invite you to comment upon that the decision. Well, um, we actually did discuss this point when when drafting and, and actually with the uh, parliamentary clerks the 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 point is is that the act is giving authority to the trustees it's empowering them to make the payment um and 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 on the basis that they make the payment then the f the fund is dissolved and the assets transferred to the charity the if you look at the sort of sequence in the in the statute, the sort of phase two, as it were, won't happen until phase one has happened. So the payments have to be made to the beneficiaries. The Act gives them the power to do that. And then once that is done, then the remaining assets get transferred to the charitable trust. Much. Um, we had a... No further questions. Thank you very much uh, for coming along this morning and as agreed in um, agenda item one we will now move into private session. Suspend briefly.